natural process is that you've given the children the platform to talk through their voice and you've allowed them to heal. Take us through that process, because I mean, it's not, it's not an easy one to do, and especially um, in the one case where, where now children had to be adopted and put into new homes, taken from different environments. Um, geographically, you, the demographics are totally different. Um, and then on top of it, you've got to deal with the trauma. Yeah, yeah. let's go through that process. No, we, we tried as much as possible to keep the children where they were except for my sister's children, because now they had to move from Westbury to Dranfontein, uh, a township called Tupac's West, which is another kind of township. So, and my sister-in-law, then, because, you know, with Africans, we don't adopt. We just take these children. They belong to you. So we don't go through the adoption process. So my sister-in-law, that is why I call her my sister-in-love, bless her kind soul. We, we didn't know what we were going to do with these three children. Remember, we've just buried their mother. Their father is on the run. We didn't know what to do. So without even consulting her husband, who is my brother, Marlene said to us, I will take the children. I did not, you know, I didn't know what to do. However, because we had a big family, we all decided to pitch in and help, help her with the children. And then my sister decided to keep her grandchildren. So it, it, it's, it's been a very, very difficult process. As I say, we are still battling, particularly with the youngest ones, because my sister's son, Beautiful young man. He has also written uh, uh, his chapter here. But he's badly, he's, ba he's really badly. So it's, it's an ongoing process. It is an ongoing process. And we pray every day that, you know, they will, they will find themselves because they can't keep, keep the, the sins of the Father can't keep affecting their lives. It's not fair. It's not fair on young people. It's also not fair on the parents to be left with, with small children. So, you know, we have to be very, very careful with young women. Uh, be very careful. The men that you choose to love or to get married to, be very careful. I always say, Waksha in Pama A1, Ubale. Because in Pama A1 will turn to a kick it will turn to throwing things at you. People can do ugly things when they are angry. But us as older women, we've also got to learn to change our behavior, to change our language on how we communicate with younger people. We should stop saying, on young people. And that is why the first one that comes and says, yeah, turn down, you shut, they then agree. And then find themselves in trouble. The other thing is, when a young couple gets married, which was from a liar, Tinaboko, or Abo auntie, the language that we use, we then tell you that uh, a man never gets asked where he is from. So this man can walk in at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., sometimes the following day is your husband. Or maybe your partner, you are living together. And you should not ask. Because Abu Antibate, Bima Hoos. The other thing is, then we are told, don't hang your dirty linen in public, my child. In even the abuse should end in the bedroom, for goodness sake. That's how our children get killed. And then sometimes we even go as far as saying, I will not divorce. Huh? And too often. So there is no divorce in this family. So don't come back. You know what? She comes back in a coffin. 
because you said go. And then I heard another one, Dr. Judy and I were speaking at an event in, in, in somewhere in Sandton, and this young woman said, That's a Tuana Hadwe, Libita Lamo Sadi, Lekobo Hadi. Your grave is at your in loss. So, no Abula or Mumi. So, we've got to change our language. Even the songs that we sing at weddings. What? My family knows I watch them. They start the wrong one and say, yay, not that one. Start a quickly. Start, start a happier song. Can you hear you for our family wedding? Yes. Because the moment you say my this poor girl holds on to this Mayamoyana as a remix until she gets killed. So older women have to, to have to change our language. And I see every, every, everybody here is much younger than me. But when I talk to my age group, I tell them, be very careful. And, and I'm, I'm actually very glad that the, 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 the audience is very, very young because as we know in, in abusive situations, there's always a trail, there's always signs. Um, to both ladies, let's, let's address some of the signs that were there for both, for, 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 for both of the tragedies came. And, and then and later on, I also want to discuss because there's a lot of victim blaming that happens. And a lot of people say, well, why didn't she leave? Um, circumstances, demographics often don't allow it. Uh, in the case with Taylor, she was going to leave. She had left. And it was because she had left that he came back. And that's when that's when he ended her life. But but let's look at look at the different signs that are there. And and the reason why I want to emphasize this, and it's gonna come from everyone here, because a lot of the time as women, because we 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 we've been programmed that we, we, we think we're overreacting. Um, a lot of the time we don't listen to our intuition because we think, ah, no, it, 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 I'm overreacting or you're not valuing valuing your, your pain and so forth. So let's, let's, let's go through through the signs that were there, just, just as proof. I'll, I'll go first. There are so many telltale signs while you're going out sometimes where someone is so possessive and you think that is a sign of love, and it isn't. When someone is that possessive, they think they own you. Relationships are supposed to be partnerships, equal partnerships. I'm not saying you find a way of coexisting and playing to each one's strength. So if you like doing this and you do it better, do it and I'll support you by doing what I find best to do and even getting help for that matter, which is fine. There is this thing that as women, going back to the adverts, we expect certain things from girls, from women, even young, old, old. What if that's how he's wired? My husband wakes up earlier than I do, and that's cool. That's who he is. So we expect too much from women. The other sign that I'm just warning the young men and women in the room is that you get emotionally abused. You have a partner who has a tendency of saying things that make you feel less than you who you are. That is a sign. And when that happens, you need to alert your partner that I don't like it when you say this because this is how I feel when we do that. Partnerships about getting the best out of each other. It's about your sanctuary. It's supposed to be. When the world is against you, you should be able to get to the room and your partner makes you feel better. Not worse. It's not about you do well at work, you get a promotion, and you get home, and then you are made to feel less because someone has a complex. So those, even before they raise a hand, you must read those signs that 
is this guy competitive or is this girl competitive towards me? Does he or she rejoice in my success? Or does he actually try and pull me down? Because in that type of relationship, you are not going to grow. To stay, you are going to minimize yourself, and that is setting your soul. I always say, no human being, not your mother, not your partner, not your child, is worth selling your soul for. Because once you lose yourself to make someone happy, you've lost yourself, and no one is worth it. And so, so powerful, thank you, because the, the, the chilling recollection, I think it was from Nettie, who used to work at SABC, and how the norm of her going to work on a Monday, because on the weekend, that is where a lot of the violence was heavier, used to go to work with a blue eye, and then got to the point where she left the job. So it's, it's losing the soul, but then you're also losing food for your family and so forth. Um, I'd like to allow you to continue. Yes. The other side is when a man is so possessive that they will tell you, I don't want your family in my house. And these friends of yours, I don't want to see them in my house. You know what he is doing? He's isolating you. Isolating you so that when you have that black eye and he goes and buys you flowers, you can then say, I will write Yanka. That is very dangerous. So those are signs that you must look out for. Men that be little women that, that think that women belong to them. I, I spoke about uh, 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 the music that we sing, even the music that we listen to. If I can't have you, nobody else can. Those are songs. It's full of old John Legend, or whatever. And we listen. And we think that is life. Yes. So we must be very careful. Um, the other aspect is, 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 and going back to also what, what, what Dr. Judy said, was that in a family unit, it is up to both the parents to be looking after the children. And whatever your discussions are on where it is, that is, that is with you. But the other thing that really made me angry was that not only was he abusive to her, but he was, wasn't even working. He was, he was spending his days on the balcony doing drugs. Where was he getting the money from? Um, let's talk about that aspect, and I, and I want to bring this up because there's so many young people in the room, is that love should not be dependent on you just being the slave for the family. Yes, my sister was employed, her husband was not employed, and in fact, when we went to court, after he had killed her and was arrested, when he appeared in court, he said she was the only person in my life that ever loved me, and I killed her. But then we also discovered that he came from an extremely violent background himself. In fact, his mother had committed suicide by setting herself alight. And when I heard that, I, I felt sorry for him. And as we left the court, I said to my siblings that were with me, I, you know, I have forgiven him. You know, I almost got myself lynched. But I said to them, no, 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 for you know, forgiveness is between my God and me because this young man had, but that, that was not an excuse. But he behaved that way because of the background that he came from. Now, the other day I was look, listening to a radio station and in this program they were talking about femicide and it was a very new case. Uh, this lady's name, I think, Ubo Nim, and her sister, Lontantla, had just been killed by the husband. And she was saying that when they were trying to work out why she had not left, or why she had not got him arrested, because she had been abused on several occasions, she said that he had such a good position at work, I didn't want to spoil that for him. And look what happened. Another 
forward, a doctor that passed away recently, but thank God she didn't die from femicide. She was also in an abusive relationship. And when she was asked by one of her mentees, because she was a mentor to many young women, and one of the young women asked her, but why did you not leave? She said, I did not want to disappoint you young women because you look up to me. So as women, we tend to always put other people first, even at the risk of losing our lives. And also another very, very common fact is that there's the so-called remorse from, from, from perpetrators. Um, and these are some of the tactics that people use when you go report the crime. So, uh, you know, if he's just an argument, he won't do it again. Or he was raised that way, we, we need to forgive him. Um, let's, talk, let's talk about the aspect of the psychological aspect of that, of actually always forgiving the perpetrator as opposed to putting your feelings in pain before. Uh, you know, what I always say, Rosie, is that we need to love ourselves first as we know. That's one of the challenges that we have. We love everyone else and we come last. We need to love ourselves and say, there's no way I'm going to love you more than I love myself. If I allow myself to be abused by you, then I'm actually not loving myself. So if you don't leave, you have to make it a condition that the only way I'm going to stay with you in this relationship, which is emotionally abusive, I'm not even getting to physical, you go and get help. If you don't go and get help, then I'm out. I think we are not using therapy as much as we should and as much as we can. We need to remove the stigma that if you go for psychological therapy, it's a sign of weakness, because it isn't. We have a very high incidence of mental illness in this country, which is part of the reason we have this violent behavior for men. We need to address that. If we have a colleague, if we have a relative who shows signs of anger, violence, abuse, we need to go to that person and say you need help and try and assist them. Because you know when we grew up, just as an example, alcoholism, because that's the other thing that actually makes people be abusive. Alcoholism, drug abuse. We actually blamed the abuser of alcohol or drugs. It's a disease. So how we handle these things, it's not saying we are condoning doing of the wrong thing, we are simply saying, if you have an alcohol problem, if you have a substance abuse problem, if you have a mental problem, you are sick. Go and seek help. When you don't seek help, then it becomes a problem. But you have to seek help. And also accountability. We spoke about the fact that, you know, in both cases, it was, it was family love, there was that support. But, and in many cases with perpetrators, especially with Druid, is that the neighbor knew about the abuse. The neighborhood knew about the abuse. You know, the, the, the chilling um, tale of the story where somebody was shouting to the child, like, well, your mother's been beaten again. So this was a norm that was happening. And we need to, to, to break that cycle. And, and, it, and, it, and, and this starts with the guys. What are you doing? When a guy is looking at a 12-year-old girl in the wrong way, are you laughing? What conversations are you having with the boys in the locker room or drinks afterwards? I read a quote and I'm going to paraphrase it. Would you be happy if you had a daughter? If you had a daughter, would you be happy dating the guy that you are now when you were 16 years old? And I praise and I put this question to a lot of my guy friends and they were like, that's scary. So let's talk about, about the, the accountability and, 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 and how it became the norm in some of the, in, in some of the cases within, within, the, within, the, uh, within the neighborhood and, and the environment. Yeah, as I said earlier on, the children who grow up in violent communities themselves become violent. And, and Dr. Judy also mentioned 
the fact of healing the wounds of the past. Because unless we heal those wounds, it will, this violence will keep going on. And it seems to be getting worse these days. Every day when you open the newspaper, a woman has been killed. And the new thing now is kill and set on fire. Why? So the accountability aspect is very, very important. However, we, we, we need a police force that is empathetic. Yes. They need to be trained to say when a woman comes to, in fact, we should have women at the desk where women can go and report this violence because they probably will understand. But this thing of saying, when I went say, no when say huh? was it that bad? Yes, yes. Or a woman gets raped and then it's uno aperitivo. You know. So we need to we need to have people that understand these things so that we can there can be accountability. Another issue that that uh, that came to mind is when we when we you know as we're talking is women who will say. I could not leave for the sake of the children. Yes, yes, yes. You don't leave for the sake of the children, but the children see abuse on a continuous basis. This young boy, this young man that sees the father hitting the mother is so very proud of this hatred, this anger, and one day he will do something. And I think it's normal also. Yes. And um, also, I mean, I, I, earlier on I said, you know, that the guys also need to be held accountable. But also ladies, there are also some of us who push these patriarchal ideologies and, and, and are victim blaming and gaslighting us. You know, a couple of years ago I was beaten up in, in Botswana and somebody went into Twitter and said, why is it a big thing? Women are being beaten up every single day. Why is it a big thing because it happened to those who them? And it's true, why was it a big thing because it happened to me? Because it should be a big thing if it's happened to every single person, whether you're a man, woman, transgender, whoever you are, you know. Um, I'd like now I'd like to open up the floor if there are any questions. There should be a roving mic. Um, I see one, two. So we'll start with the first two questions here in the front. Yeah. Hi everyone, hello. Um, um, you touched on the talking within the family in terms of forgiveness. Um, the moment when Rosie mentioned forgiveness, my heart was just like, no, I really don't want to, you know? Because you feel like, like your mom said, it's unfair. It's honestly just unfair. The fact that you go through something, then I must take the responsibility to heal for something that you did. So I'm just um, wondering, within um, a family setup where things are very, it's an uncomfortable conversation to have to begin with, how do you even start it? Because everybody is in pain and everybody's dealing with the pain the best way that they can at that moment. And um, when you were talking about how the 19, -year -old, the 19 year old is still lashing out, you know, she's still dealing. And I mean, She's dealing outwardly, some of us deal inwardly, you know, we all deal differently. But how do you, how do you actually, like how do you introduce the concept of forgiveness? Because um, mom said when she got out of court and she said that she had forgiven him, they were not having it. You understand, there are some people who just don't want to have the conversation because you see them every day. Some of us um, are faced with issues that we have to see the people who hurt us every day and now it's like this man is breathing here and I'm still dealing, you know, you know, so how I hope you understand your question. <laughs> Today, the date I get is three months from now. 
For three months, I need to make sure that this child still eats. We still get there on that day, somebody wants paternity test. That's another two weeks. From there after, somebody puts a job. So we're now looking at a two-year fight that I would need to undergo in order to get money that is due to a child, in order for me to be able to take care of children that we brought in the system together. So sometimes I feel the system itself doesn't help us as women leave these homes because the fight itself is so deep. If people die, it's 10 years. Right now there was a case for a year, 10 years, the person had to fight to get the money and things attached. The pension fund, in order to get um, the money, at least for future maintenance, that's a two-year fight because it's not necessarily regulated. You still need to go and fight for that. So how are we then building a system that is going to then support us as females to get out, but in the same breath, I feel solving that issue through SARS, vanishes and all of that puts us in danger. Because sometimes you're even scared to go to those courts because you're thinking you're going to be killed. Kids are dying because fathers don't want to take their kids. How they do we put things in place to make sure it serves us as women, serves the kids, and we're not fighting daily to go fight for our rights? That is true. Uh, I'm going with the first one, the concept of forgiveness. It, it's funny how you give away your power when you hold a grudge against another human being. They consume you. When they succeed, you are angry. Because how can they? They've wronged you. The way to get your power back is to make the people that hurt you non-existent. And they shouldn't matter. They, they don't deserve your emotion. And the emotion of anger and hatred destroys you and not the other person. He's going around doing his own thing and you are here. It's like a cancer. It eats on you. When you pray, I believe in prayer. When you pray and say, God, remove this person. He's not worth the pain he's giving you. He's not worth the hatred and the anger. Then you get your power back. That is the reason you forgive. It's not for the other person, it's for you and your own sanity. I quite get the second question, but I think you were talking about empowering women to be able to leave abusive relationships. Okay, please, please uh, uh, explain. Maybe let me try. Okay. You are saying the system fails women. Okay. It's women who actually have to go. The default position is that it's the woman's problem. And then she gets herself exposed to the person who's not, who's not doing what they're supposed to do. True. I believe, Pastor, that we don't make our government as accountable as we should. We don't take it upon ourselves and our hands to say, let's read these policies. Are they serving us? If they are not, we will have a petition that says, this is the policy that we would like to see because this policy will serve women. We need to do that. When our president says, I'm allocating two billion rand to sort out the issue of gender-based violence. We need to know where is this money being taken from? Because it's be, if it's being taken from another area which was serving women, we haven't done anything. And also, what is this two billion rand going to be allocated to? We want to have a say. One of the reasons why U Commissioner Angie and I have these dialogues is to say, we have a crisis, we have a challenge, let's talk about them, intergender, intergenerationally. And each of these dialogue events that we have, we are recording suggestions, challenges that are raised mainly by the young people, because we want to be able to take this and say, this is what the country says, and what 